Welcome. Now, I know you guys are dedicated, okay, because I don't know about you, but that was a long walk from the core down there to get here. So the fact that you even found the room is sort of, you know, one strike against this talk. And then the second one is the fact that you came and ETL was in the title. I, <laughs> I realized that I probably made a mistake a few weeks ago putting that into the title. I mean, how many here, when they hear ETL, think of like joy and unicorns and all things of happiness? Okay, I, I can't help you. You have, to, you have to leave. Okay, another raise of hands. How many of you, if you've been told that you're going to be assigned onto an ETL project, might cause some slight discomfort like a, you know, a blister or splinter? Okay, how many of you? at that. Nobody? Okay, a few. Okay, there's a couple. Okay, n last one. How many of you rather go to the dentist or have somebody pick at your eyes than be on an ETL type of project? Okay, so there's some more honesty here. So, you know, welcome by the way. My name is Daryl Dutton. I'm from T4G. Uh, and with me is Kenneth uh, Poon. He's from uh, Royal Bank of Canada, or RBC for short. So we've come down from Canada. And today, what we really want to talk about, this is kind of like a therapy session, I think, for ETL. You know, this is really what we're going to go through is sort of a journey uh, that we took last year of trying to move from traditional, um, relational, batch-oriented ETL and move towards more open, uh, streaming and rearrange those ETL letters a little bit. So, <clears throat> so anyway, what, in order to kind of cover that, this is what we're going to kind of roughly going to go through. We're going to go through like the use case, or Kenneth will kind of set the picture where we kind of started in our journey, and then sort of what the drivers were to sort of modernize this, uh, the ETL process, and then I'll kind of come back and uh, and talk about the actual solution of how we put these sort of pieces together. And then, <coughs> excuse me, and then we'll have uh, Kenneth sort of talk about the benefits, especially from the business point of view, and then also some of the challenges. And I guarantee you, if you've done ETL, you will love the last part. It's our choices of the good, the bad, and the ugly that came from this project. So, so without further ado, I'll get, give it to Kenneth here and he'll sort of lay out uh, what this stuff's all about for the use case. All right, so uh, ESS, so this is the new ser event service we built at RBC last year. Um, what the event service is, is it's, um, what it does is it collects all customer interaction data across all different channels, such as all the online banking sites, all the mobile apps, um, ATMs, what you do at the bank branch and when you call in to the contact center. So we collect all these events into a central repository, apply analytics to it, and then make the data available through APIs. So the idea originated around eight years ago with an old system called ECS in RBC, which is Event Capture Service. So the intent with that was it started collecting events from different channels, and it mainly started with the digital channels, online banking, and mobile apps. And the main goal was just to load into the Teradata data warehouse for internal batch reporting. So the, even though the data was being collected in real time, it was kind of doing the opposite of what we're trying to do here. Um, we're trying to make the events available in real time for analytics. Um, so over time, the old system became very expensive and difficult to maintain. Um, teams didn't want to onboard, um, send new events there. The process was just too long. It, it would take months to make any changes. Uh, so over time, the um, data set became incomplete. New events were no longer in there. So it made it pretty much unusable for customer journey reporting. So last year, RBC partnered with T4G to build a new event service, ESS, that will address all the pain points of the old system and be designed in such a way to be able to capture all events across all channels right now and into the future. So one of the top priorities in 2018 at RBC is to be able to link the online and offline activities of a customer to get a holistic view of their journey. Um, so we're collecting all this data on the customer interaction activities across the different channels. So one of the main qu common questions we get asked by a, a lot of groups is, what are we doing with all this data? Um, so the, the, um, the goal is really to turn all these raw events into actionable insights that can improve the customer experience and the bank's bottom line. So at a high level, what we want to do is construct customer journeys from the interaction data 
And this will help us predict life events. So through path analysis and prediction, knowing a customer's current and next stage in life, and even the current and next action, it lets RBC, um, puts us in a position to provide them with more relevant offers and recommendations in a timely manner. And because we also track location for, cer across, for certain channels, we can also target them with geo-targeted offers. Uh, some of the other use cases we're currently working on is advisor support. So when you call into the phone, uh, when you call in um, to the call center, um, we're enabling, we're providing real-time interaction data from the customer on the advisor's dash dashboard. So when you call in and authenticate yourself, they can see what you've been doing online and what you've been struggling with to optimize the conversation. Um, so this is more to assist with problem resolution. Another use case is like digital to offline efficiencies. So where can we identify opportunities to reduce advice center call volumes? So if we know that customers are always struggling to do certain operations um, online and on mobile apps, those are opportunities that we can fix to reduce um, how many people call in. And uh, one of the, and the last use case is sales attribution. So this is to identify the right digital marketing mix to drive sales. So we need to be able to link online digital activities such as research and when people are browsing through the pages to offline conversations at the branch such as in mortgage applications. So some things you just can't do online like apply for mortgages. But, we want, but when people do apply for mortgages at the branch, we want to know if they're applying to a mortgage for RBC because they did the research online. And this will um, allocate the funding accordingly to where we should do our marketing. Um, so before we started building the old system, we wanted to understand what the um, legacy system is. So this is the architecture for the um, old ECS. So basically there are two flows. Um, it's pretty much traditional ETL flow. Um, all the source systems would send um, XML um, SOAP event message to data power. It gets routed to MQQ, which gets fed into a territated uh, T-pump utility, goes in a staging table, and it goes through a mini-batch uh, process using BTEC SQL. So that's another Teradata utility. Um, lands in a warehouse, um, gets flattened out, and then it, it's made available for internal reporting. So ad hoc querying um, um, and reporting over OBI and Tableau. So all of this runs on the mainframe. Um, so for the batch feed, what, what it did it was it would copy files from the mainframe, copy it to the data stage, load it into the warehouse, and go through the same mini batch process to make it then available for reporting. So I, as you can see, we use quite a few vendor products here. Um, it's very difficult to find resources who know mainframe or are even interested in working on mainframe. Um, the folks who actually worked on this system are mostly are retired. Um, switch teams are no, no longer with the bank. Um, but <laughs> technology was only like half the problem. So there were some other problems with it, um, having a rigid um, XML schema. And because it, everything was running on the mainframe, it, felt, it followed the traditional development and deployment cycle, which would take months to deploy a single change. Um, so it made it really expensive to use this system. OK, so since we, we're going to build a, a complete brand new event service to, um, to make it easier for systems to integrate with and make it no longer an afterthought to send events to the service, we figured we'd all, also modernize the tech stack a bit to make it less costly to enhance support and maintain. Um, as customers go digi digital these days and do more of their banking online and on apps, we are seeing uh, the number of interaction events generated on these channels exponentially outgrow the number of events that the old system was able to handle. So RBC was, failing to, was falling behind in the channel analytics space. Uh, this is a huge loss opportunity for the bank if we can't capitalize on all this data that's being generated to analyze customer banking behavior and tendencies. Um, so over the last six months, um, several new features have been rolled out across the different channels, especially um, online and mobile apps. And we're pretty pleased to say that the new ESS service has been able to keep up with the demand. And we were also able to go back and capture some of the critical business events from the channels that were not on board in the old system, such as bank branch and call center. Um, so I'll hand it over to Daryl now to talk about the key components of the new solution. Cool. Thanks, Ken. Does that look familiar at all, the ETL process there? No, not at all? OK. OK, so let's talk about some of the key parts of the solution of where we want to go to. And you can tell by the title of the slide where so, some of this is coming up. So the first thing that we kind of need to do, or when I saw this problem you know, about a year or so ago, 
we need to actually do the E and the L part, so we need to be able to extract and load. And so our choice for that was going to be NiFi. And why NiFi? Well, I tell you, one of the things that when you start using the product, that you get familiar with it really quickly, is that you can build pipelines very, very quickly. There are a number of processors, and at the time when we were using it, there was probably about 200 plus processors, and now that's sort of doubled in the time the, with, the, with the latest release. So it had all the in different integration points that we wanted to. But probably the number one thing that I liked about it as a choice here, it was configuration over code. And it allowed us to have that faster dev cycle to build out these pipelines uh, quicker uh, than anything else that, uh, that we'd have. Um, so that's the extraction piece. What about the T, the transformation piece? You know, we have the data, and we need to be able to transform it quickly. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Ken mentioned that, you know, we had a batch process that would run, you know, it would run every 10 or 15 minutes. It would be that nightly batch. Well, now we want to try to do that as quick and as fast as we can do it. So our choice for that was Spark Streaming. Now, if some of you in here in streaming, you might say, well, Spark Streaming is not really for streaming. But for our use case, for the transformations the mini, uh, to doing sort of the mini batch uh, modes, it was good enough for us. And what it allowed us to do, especially with structured stru uh, um, Spark Streaming, it was a very elegant programming model and API for us to use. If you've ever looked at even the samples of that, it is just it almost strips away all the infrastructure code that you have. And it really leaves the developer uh, focused on the transformations, the filtering, and the things that you need to do the, uh, uh, as part of your transform. And then we could have Scala, you know, a powerful language where we weren't going to get boxed in by something that we couldn't transform, or Java or Python, whatever your choice is. Now, there's <coughs> one last piece here that might not be as obvious. Um, we still need to glue some of this stuff together. We still need to move data across boundaries. And we want to do that in sort of a reliable way. So we selected CAFTA to do that. Okay, so um, it's the reliable messaging system. Uh, we knew we were going to get guaranteed. We knew we were also going to be able to provide significant downtime if we had to across these boundaries if necessary. So uh, CAFTA was sort of a key uh, decision to make sure that we had that decoupling across the systems. OK, so here's the slide. And I, I'm, and I can see how the cameras are going to go up here in a second. So here's the solution. So we came from uh, that processing uh, that we had for the traditional ETL. So it's the same thing. So for our, our real-time sort of events, we didn't change, actually, some of the IBM products. We didn't disturb what was in the front. But what we did do is that we got that feed, and we immediately put that into NiFi, which then from there we were able to split and route to take a copy of the raw thing that came in. We also put the, the next copy on CAFTA uh, to be moved or be to, to, to cross that boundary and to go to Spark Streaming. And Spark Streaming did the transformation and did it quickly. And then from there, we actually put it back onto CAFTA which then could be then consumed by those same downstream sort of applications and, and other sources. Now, you might see there's some other arrows that are going uh, up and around. We actually feed even the trans transformed version of the event back into NiFi. Why? Because it was extremely easy for us then just to wire that up and put it back into HDFS, you know, just with a couple processor. <coughs> So that's the real-time events. The batch stuff, again, we didn't change too much on the front here. We still get the text files uh, from the mainframe. We had the data stage process. We might have modified that slightly to then feed into HDFS instead of a relational database. So there we got our raw storage uh, into HDFS. And NiFi picks that up very easily, puts that data back into motion, the same kind of path. Go into CAFTA do the transformations in Spark Streaming, where then anyone can consume it after that. So as soon as we land those files, within a few minutes, that data is already available uh, downstream to anyone that needs to consume it. And again, we take a copy, put it into HDFS, so we always have our raw and the transformed version. 
um, the last piece here that's on the top is sort of, I wanted to make sure to make a point of this, is that NiFi also allowed us to do some utility things uh, that help for, dev, uh, help for operation pieces. So we were able to detect, for example, if we didn't get a flow that went to HDFS or it failed, we could detect that flow, have another process that sent us an email. So for ops, we'd get notification that something bad was happening. And then in addition, at any one of our feeds, we could actually feed that into Elasticsearch and put Kibana on the front of that to get sort of real-time uh, operation events that were kind of going on with the data, or even look at the data itself and sort of see how many personal touch banking you know, operations are we having per minute, you know, per day, per month. Okay, so that's roughly the solution there. I wanted to just touch briefly on two parts of the implementation for this group. One is NiFi. So with NiFi, we just put these on VMs, nothing special. Uh, we, at the, a year ago, we weren't doing any containerization or anything, so these just went on. These VMs sort of act as sort of edge nodes uh, to the cluster. They were, they were clustered themselves, um, so no surprise here on, the, on this part of the implementation. But what we did do is we added a third node um, uh, as a standalone. Now, why? What we found was is developers will tend to create kind of utility kind of flows, whether to test their, functionally test their flows or create load sort of scripts uh, or load processors that generate sort of traffic or whatever to, tell, uh, to test the system. We didn't want those clouding the canvas so much or, or, or distinguish between what was really the pipeline and what were really sort of developer sort of created uh, utilities. The second piece is that if we have to uh, monitor, or sorry, if we have to upgrade the OS, the VM, or whatever, we had another node there available that was in production that could take the load it off, you know, during slower times to actually uh, do the maintenance and then uh, take it over later. The last piece I want to mention here is this is what we had to do uh, for Zookeeper. And now, for those of you who have clustering, Zookeeper is a pretty common thing. Um, but we actually end up Im implementing two instances across all these things. Uh, why? Because with Zookeeper, you kind of need an odd number of, of uh, Zookeeper things to, to do the elections and stuff in case something bad happens. You always need at least three. So if you look at the failure things, if you walk through this and you say your first VM kind of goes down, you at least have three instances and it can afford to even fail a Zookeeper instance and you're still up and running as far as your cluster is concerned. Same thing if the second host goes down, there's always three that are available. And then last but not least, the same thing will happen. So that's kind of why we have two instances across. Okay. Let's talk about Spark for a second. Uh, I want to walk through sort of uh, how Spark kind of gets deployed. We, you saw probably in the previous slide we had Yarn up there as the host. So it kind of looks like this to deploy a Spark streaming application. First of all, on your edge node, you're going to package up your Spark app, and then immediately it's going to do a submit uh, onto the Yarn. Yarn takes that in the <coughs> at the resource manager, uh, looks for resources to be uh, assigned. It will assign that to one of the node managers, and this is, ends up being your Spark driver or application master in, in Yarn's case. From there, depending on how you've configured it, um, you have your executors. So your executors, the programs will go out to those, and now your Spark streaming app is started. So nothing special here, but the point I wanted to try to make here with, uh, on this implementation is because we have Kafka sort of on the front and the back of what's feeding Spark streaming, it's really important to think about partitioning for your app. So this is sort of my advice to folks that are looking at this. You want to make sure that it's either one-to-one -one or some ratio in order to get the parallelization to work the way that you want. And this is because when your app starts working, first thing it's going to do is going to look for an offset from, from your cluster. And then from those offsets, it's actually going to then assign work to those edge nodes. Uh, sorry, not the edge nodes, sorry, the, the executors to, to do the work based on those offsets. So in here, in this case, it's going to read, hopefully in parallel, and this is why the ratio is important of the partitions to executors. Once they're finished doing the work, um, there's one last task that happens, 
and that is that the driver then will actually write those offsets, in this case to HDFS, so that when you have a failure, you know, you can always have something back. It's sort of like, think of this as a watermark. Okay, so now that you've got the solution really quickly, I'm gonna hand it back over to Ken, and he's gonna walk through some of the benefits uh, of, the, of the solution. Okay, so um, from what Daryl described, um, there are quite a few benefits in this uh, new architecture. So instead of the events being now available for processing after 60 minutes, um, Spark Streaming allows, this, allows, us to be, allows the events to be consumed in near real time within seconds. Um, so that's 60 minutes. It used to only be 10 minutes. So over the years, they gradually increased it from 10 minutes to 20 minutes to 30 minutes to 60 minutes because the mini batch process that did all the joins was just taking too long with, as the volume of data um, kept increasing. Um, also, building a distributed system allows us to scale horizontally. So as the event volume increases over time, we can easily add more nodes to the NiFi cluster, add more partitions to the Kafka topic, or even increase the number of Spark executors. Uh, we did move away from a bunch of vendor products and embrace the open source, although we are still using Confluent for the, our Kafka cluster and Hortonworks for Hadoop. So using open source frees us from vendor locking and sort of assures us long-term viabil uh, viability. It's also easier to find developers who are more interested in working on new tech, which allows for succession planning. Um, so this, this is pretty key. So at RBC, as soon as you mention anything mainframe, data stage, JCLs, like, like you, no developers want to talk to you. They don't even want to they kind of look the other way and pretend they never heard, hear what you say. Um, so not everything was new though. So in lieu of a, we didn't have a REST proxy for Kafka, that's what we really wanted to start receiving new events. But because we didn't have that due to some security concerns at RBC, we, um, like Daryl said, we leveraged the same data power and MQ infrastructure to receive new events. We just created new endpoints on, on there. Um, so this ensures a high, high availability of fault tolerance. Um, this is proven infrastructure that's been around for um, 10 plus years. And when we asked the infrastructure team, like, like how often does it go down? When does it go down? They said, this never goes down. It's like always up 100%. Um, also, using NiFi sped up the development, allowed for quick prototyping and testing. Also made it operationally easier to manage the data in motion through visual controls. Um, as with any new project, we encountered some challenges along the way. Um, so first of all, it was all the new libraries that we're using. Um, no one on the team really had experience with Kafka, Spark, NiFi, Hadoop when we started. And then because we're using Spark, we also had to introduce a new uh, program programming language, Scala. So all my developers are all Java background. They didn't know any Scala, but wanted to use it for Spark streaming. It, it was probably all the propaganda online uh, for using Scala on Spark. Don't believe <laughs> Um, but the thing is, if you have zero experience in Scala, prototyping to get something to work is way different than writing a production-grade app. Um, so understanding what the old service did was also a challenge. Um, there, wasn't, there were a couple of folks who worked on the old system who weren't really willing to help. Um, as soon as they heard that you're rebuilding something that they built over the years, they sort of kind of give you like kind of cut-eye look and they don't, wanna, they don't, they don't share any information. Um, so as a result, we also didn't have the skill set to like, log into the mainframe um, and do the analysis, kind of backwards engineer what, um, what the old system was doing. So we decided instead of doing a like for like, we're just gonna completely just um, like, sim like simplify the whole event service and just make it easier to maintain going forward. Um, at RBC, there's a lot of security requirements around these um, processes. Like all the communication had to be over SSL. Um, everything, all the connections had to be Kerbal self-authenticated. So we had, a, like, we had to create a lot of certs. So we had certs, like, we had certs between the NiFi nodes, certs to secure the NiFi instance. Um, connecting the HDFS Kafka Elasticsearch, we had to create different certs for those. Um, we, were, like, we got a lot of experience like, creating key stores and um, key tabs over the last year. Um, open source projects, um, we, because we use uh, NiFi Kafka Spark, um, there's always new versions coming up every few months. As of now, we've gone through three versions of NiFi already. So we started with 1.1, and before we went live, we upgraded to 1.3, and just recently, a couple months ago, we upgraded 1.5. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, also, when we started, we only had Kafka 0.9 available on the HDP 2.4 cluster, but because we're using Spark Streaming 2.2, we needed Kafka 0.10 or higher to support the SSL for Spark Streaming integration with Kafka. So uh, we didn't have a 
Kafka 0.10 cluster. So we had to spawn up our own until the platform team was ready. And this took around four to five months to spawn up a separate Kafka 0.10 cluster. And this was before RBC had um, onboard Confluent. Um, so these were like just Apache Kafka clusters that um, our, our group was using. Um, so to prevent ESS from becoming obsolete over time, um, we're gonna have to continue to optimize and simplify the tech stacks for the next generation of folks. They don't retire our, our service in like the next five years. Okay, so after a year working with Hadoop, MiFi, Spark, Kafka, Elasticsearch, um, we're becoming pretty proficient at it at RBC, but this wasn't always the case last year. So last year, both the, the development and platform teams, they were all learning at the same time. So the dev teams were learning how to build production-grade apps on Hadoop, and the platform team was learning how to manage and operate an enterprise Hadoop and Kafka cluster that supports multi-tenancy. Um, so there were a lot of stability issues we encountered. Sometimes a dev cluster was just not available for us to use. Um, so I'll go over our experience with NiFi, and Daryl will go over our experience with Spark Streaming. Um, so with NiFi, one of the things, um, um, as a manager, one of the things I love about NiFi was how quickly it is for developers to whip up uh, new flows. Um, so NiFi is perfect if you're moving data from one or more sources to one or more sinks. So code reviews are also much easier now. It's not subjective to different coding styles, um, since NiFi is more like configuration over code. Um, but one new thing that we start griping about is how straight the connector lines are and how much spacing there is between our processors. <laughs> There's no like, format, like magic format button that will just reposition everything for you. You kind of got to drag it, like position it yourself. Um, I was never a big fan of um, these drag and drop ETL dev tools in RBC, so some of the other ones that we have are BusinessWorks and DataStage. Uh, but NiFi, um, I, like, I'll, even when I started using NiFi, I was a bit uh, on the fence, a bit skeptical whether we should just, just code everything in Java. Uh, but NiFi gives you more control, has an easy to use interface, and it, it's pretty scalable. It does data movement very well, so I've, re I've become like a NiFi advocate over the, over the past few months. Um, debugging was extremely easy with the Providence repository. So if there's any failure in any of the messages, it was really easy to find out which message failed and why. So monitoring failures and uh, implementing retries is always a pain when you need to code it yourself. NiFi makes it very easy to configure it. So for retry, we just have a, a self loop. What we do is we configure the penalty duration on the processor to implement a, like a back off to wait a certain amount of time before we retry. The typical use case for us to implement retries was when we're writing to a sync. So whether we're writing to HDFS or Kafka um, or Elasticsearch, we will always have a retry loop because sometimes the Kerberos ticket would expire and it would fail, um, so then we would have a retry. Um, so those were, yeah, the, mostly all the processors that had retry were writing to a sync. Um, whenever there was a failure, we used the monitor activity processor. Uh, what we would do is, we would consolidate all the failures within a five minute window and send an email to support team. When the process came back up and was um, no more errors again, we would send another email that says the, like the error has recovered. So this way, our support team can just check on their phones, like on their Blackberries. They don't need to log in to actually log into the system to see what's going on. So as soon as they see a recovery email, then they know that everything is, everything is good. Um, so, um, Okay, so integration load testing. Um, so for testing, what we did was we had a lot of process groups that had a utility functions. A lot of these utility functions, all it really did was either read from disk and publish it to one of our ingestion points, like MQ or Kafka, or it would just consume from one of our destinations, like a Kafka topic. So we did this, um, we, when we did volume testing, it was very easy to set up, um, um, set up these um, utilities to just pump in thousands of messages in a short period of time to measure the expected throughput. Um, we also had Kafka consumers to verify we actually did publish it back on a Kafka topic um, to Spark Streaming. So we didn't really have to, when we we're testing, we didn't need to have the Spark Streaming up to make sure that the NiFi piece was working. So sort of like unit testing, but like a, like a bigger, like a integration testing. So the test classes normally, if we code in Java, um, this is what we used to do. So we would code all these test classes in Java. It would take us 10, 15 minutes each. But in NiFi, we can whip these up in a minute or two. Um, so with um, NiFi is like a GUI-based uh, ETL tool. So with any GUI, um, GUI tool, you need to do uh, um, um, some sort of access control. So what we did was we configured LDAP authentication against Active Directory for user login. Um, but at first, when we set up the NiFi cluster, we created SSL certificates 
imported it to our browser to be able to log in, and then we would just disable that certificate. Um, so we created um, three groups, uh, read-only, uh, read-write, and uh, an admin NIFI group, and we were able to assign different policies to each. So NIFI makes the policies pretty granular, so um, it's pretty, pretty straightforward to configure just these three types of roles. Um, so in prod, developers would just have read-only access, uh, and support folks would have write-in admin access. Okay, so supporting different environments. Um, so before I go through all the um, pain points we have here, um, a couple days ago um, I, I went to NIFI meetup. Um, Kevin Duran, he had a talk, he was explaining about NIFI registry um, and how it solves many of the pain points from the earlier versions. So keep in mind, these are all the pain points we experienced before we upgraded to the latest NIFI 1.5. Uh, I think Kevin has a talk tomorrow at 11.30 on SDLC and Apache NIFI. So that, that would be a pretty useful talk to understand how do we uh, do automated deployments. Um, so the, traditionally with our Java apps, um, what we would do is we would deploy the same jar file to each environment, but it would read from different config files. So the configs would have like different connection strings, um, usernames, passwords, um, uh, and other like configure um, parameters. But trying to replicate this in iFi wasn't that straightforward, because first of all, not all the configs could be externalized into variables. So oftentimes what we had to do was we after we deployed a new flow into um, the next environment, like UAT or prod, we would just need to manually go into the processor and just tweak the configuration. So it's a very, very error prone. Um, also, to reduce, because there's no really automated way to do like code merging or anything, what we did was for brand new flows or for refactored flows, we would just, um, we would wipe up the whole, like we would stop the ingestion points, let all the messages flow through and just replace the flow and start everything back up. But then if we had, let's say we had like five changes we did in dev and we only wanted to promote one or two to the next environment, that we had to do manually. So we have to kind of remember, look at the history to see what did we change and then just reapply that change manually. Because you can't really, there's no kind of a feature to merge the, ex, the, temp, the, the XML templates. Um, so another, um, not really concerned, but another feature that our support team um, did was, you see the different colors that we have in the background? If you've worked with NiFi, all of them are by default gray. You can't change the color um, of the background. So when we had like, multiple environments working, it, we always had to look at the URL to understand which environment we're, we're working on. So what we did was we used uh, the custom JavaScript plugin for Chrome, and we had just added some like, like a two-line JavaScript code to just change the background color. So we had to do this manually, like each developer. So I, I went to each developer's desk to just like tell That's, them. Like, this those are the did. real colors, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Th th those are the colors we use. So for dev, green, um, um, UAT yellow, and prod red. Yeah. So developers know that if like, they work on something that has a, the red background, like, don't, don't mess it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, um, so um, lastly, the NIFI version upgrade. So we recently ver um, upgraded to version 1.5 um, for NIFI. We were on 1.3 for a good eight months. So there's no real magic button to do the in-place upgrade. What we did was we created a new NIFI cluster on a different port and a separate, a parallel Zookeeper environment. Um, what we did was when we had to upgrade, we just stopped all the ingestion points on 1.3, let all the messages flow through, uh, moved the processor groups to 1.5 and just started back up. Um, so um, three re like two reasons why we upgraded. There were a lot of stability issues with 1.3. Um, I talked to Joe Witt yesterday. I had a meeting with Joe Witt yesterday. And he kind of confirmed that, uh, yeah, th like he admitted that there were a bunch of like performance and stability issues in 1.3 that were resolved in 1.4. Um, ever since we upgraded 1.5, it's been pretty stable. We haven't had any issues. Um, the other reason why we upgraded was to just keep up to date with the latest Kafka producer consumer versions. So 1.3 only supported up to 0 0.10 Kafka, um, but 1.5 supports up to 1.0. So before we actually copied the NAR files from 1.5, used it in 1.3, which is a bit risky, um, but by just upgrading to 1.5, it kind of solved, uh, um, addressed that issue. Um, so Daryl will now talk about the Spark streaming um, benefits. Cool, okay, I'll probably have to go through this kind of quickly. Okay, Spark streaming. So input, Spark streaming with CAFTA, smiley face, this is actually really good. There's nothing really you have to kind of do too much for that. They have retries, they kind of have it all kind of baked in for you, even the failovers with how the Kafka clients sort of work with that. But when you start looking at what you have to do once you have data and you need to get it out of Spark streaming, there's something you should be aware of here with the output sync. Um, 
this is actually a line from the documentation in Spark streaming. Um, the, stream <coughs> the, the streaming sticks are designed to be impotent to handle reprocessing. What does that mean for you? It means you need to handle the retry logic, especially if you're expecting you know, exactly one's type of processing. So it could be that if your thing crashes and you need to restart it, you might actually have some duplicates that come through. Just be aware of that, especially if you're not expecting that. The other thing um, that I liked about search, and I made this point before, is you focus on the code um, logic and not on the plumbing code. So this is all positive. Um, so you know, your, your, your code kind of looks like this. You have like um, a line to do your, your session, no problem. You have a line to start reading your stream, great. And then you have any number of lines to do your transformations or filters. And then you have one line to output it. Everything's good. Developer works within that. What happens, though, if you want to do something like this? You want to then add sort of like a second um, write stream. So scenario, you have your transformation coming in, and you have some error code, some errors, like you're thinking of like uh, uh, IDs that aren't there or whatever, and you know that that's sort of uh, data that's an error. You want to save that off to the side, and then you still have your happy path for the rest of your transformation. So you add a single line in your code that would actually do this. One code base, but when you execute this, what really sort of happens is this. Because of the lazy design of Spark Streaming, it really acts as sort of two different things. And just to be aware that you'll be reading Kafka twice here, one for your errors and one for that. Okay, so just be aware of this. Now, here is my choice of ugly, okay, is running and trying to deploy Spark on Yarn. Um, you know, we've had this cluster, it was there, we wanted to deploy it, so, great. So I have three parts to this ugliness of trying to get Spark Streaming working. First, deployment. What you have to do is you have to package up your deployment uh, with the jars and all the files, and uh, there's a ton of little switches, right? and I have another quick slide to show you how many switches that you actually probably will have to configure in a production environment. In our case, we actually had to package 2.2, uh, on a cluster that was 2.4 HTTP, so it only had the 1.6. So we had to make sure that all the dependencies in jars were there. So let's say now you've got your cluster, it's running, your Spark streaming's going. The next thing is, how do I stop this thing? How do I control what's there? Do I use yarn kill? If you do that, it's not going to shut down gracefully, even if there's a few flags under the covers that say that it will it will kind of done uh, ungraceful. So in order to kind of solve this problem, what we did was, let's read another Kafta topic, and Kafta has a nice little uh, console app, so you're able to kind of type commands in, and we were able to take those and then gracefully shut down. Okay, so that's the control piece. The last one is logging and instrumentation. So um, as you kind of know where Yarn sort of started from, it's just doing jobs. Um, when you start a job, it will start logging all those things to temp files, you know, onto HDFS, which really aren't accessible to you. And the logs really aren't available until the job stops. Well, your streaming app is going to go all the time, so this is not particularly useful. And if you take the defaults that Spark Streaming has, it generates a lot of logs. We actually literally got an email from the admin saying, you're using too much disk. And what was happening is our job was running there for a few days and was chewing up all the disks for the logs. So what we did is suppress that, suppressed all the log4j stuff. We added the log for 2 j and it has a nice little appender for Kafta that then we fed into NiFi to then feed into HDFS where we can control where the logs go. Okay, so then it's going into the exact same spot that we want. The nice thing now within Kafta is we have the console. So every developer and every ops person wants some kind of tail. This is the way to do it for tail for Spark Streaming. And then because we did a NiFi, we made this point earlier, we can monitor things like error, exception, bad events, and then send email notifications as well. So this actually worked quite well. But it's just, my point here is that it's not out of the box. And there's no code here, um, but it's just sort of more of a configuration. Okay, quickly, 
This is the deployment I was talking about. It's 30 plus lines. About a third of it is for logging because of the suppression. Another third is the performance. And then the rest of it is sort of standard stuff that you have to use. I wasn't meant that you have to read this. When you download the slides, you can use this as a, maybe a, you know, a good starting point. OK, let me summarize. NiFi has been great on the load extract. Ken has been very positive in his experience at RBC. I've been very positive as a consultant to use it. Uh, it's great for doing uh, format changes and routing. Spark is really good at doing those transformations, but plan on extra time to get it operationalized, no matter how you're hosting it. Um, the other thing I could say is that you want to keep it also as simple as you, as you can uh, on this stuff. OK, I think we're sort of running out of time here. Uh, that's all we had. We're kind of, we'll, we'll be able to take questions probably after. If you did like this, give us a good review or give us some love on that app. But uh, thank you very much uh, in our contacts there.